Daniel LaRusso versus arch nemesis Terry Silver, round two. Who doesn't love a martial arts grudge match? First, I took care of Chosen. Now you. Earlier this month, Cobra Kai season five dropped with some of the most brutal fights and crazy action sequences in the history of the Miyagi verse so far. Hopefully, if you're watching this video, you're all caught up because there are some major spoilers ahead. Swords. Prison riots. And all of Dojo Brawls. Lots of material if any of you guys are Cobra Kai fans. But today, we're gonna analyze Daniel and Terry's much anticipated showdown with a critical medical eye to see what information we can glean about the human anatomy. First, we'll take a look at some of the events leading up to the fight. You got your ass kicked, Danny boy. Which would have influenced our fighters. You can either accept that or I can kick it again right now. Then, as the fight plays out, we'll examine some of the techniques used, significant blows landed, and possible injuries that may have been suffered by our fighters. Let's get into it. In the red corner, we have Daniel LaRusso, who got whooped by Terry Silver earlier in the season. In their first fight, Terry really established himself as the dominant combatant, landing several significant strikes to Daniel's head and body and powering through his guard like a freaking freight train. I wouldn't be surprised if Daniel's shoulder was injured by that armbar. or if he suffered a concussion from this brutal high kick, which knocks Daniel down to the ground, teetering on the brink of consciousness. Yeah. Don't look at this as an act of mercy. On the contrary. Terry finishes off the fight with his foot on Daniel's neck, showing off his sinister ability to cause pain and damage through the strategic application of pressure to his opponents. Daniel's trachea and larynx are at Terry's mercy as he grinds the hard part of the outer sole into Daniel's neck and obstructs his breathing temporarily. With enough pressure, Terry could easily fracture the cartilage of either of these structures, leading to significant respiratory compromise and even death if not treated quickly. Not to mention the danger of damaging the esophagus cervical spine, blood vessels, and nerves that run through this area, such as the jugular vein and transverse cervical nerves. Yeah, the neck is like a super highway full of important structures, and one small slip could permanently disable Daniel. But Terry wants Daniel fully conscious so that he can further humiliate and intimidate him for what's to come, ending with his famous line, Because the real pain is about to begin. Daniel suffered multiple injuries from fighting Terry, which landed him in what at first glance seems to be a hospital bed, but upon closer inspection, he could be in a bed at home wearing a blue shirt. Either way, it's clear his injuries, though never specifically mentioned, were somewhat serious. He winces while swallowing, indicating some lasting damage to his trachea and pharynx, or even perhaps his esophagus, likely bruising. Worse yet, he may be suffering from minor cervical instability, also known as cervicogenic dysphagia. Cervical instability can be linked to cervical spine nerve compression, which can be an unseen cause of swallowing difficulties, esophageal spasms, and acid reflux. We can also see that he suffered several facial contusions, with one on his left eye and the surrounding area and the bridge of his nose. A contusion or bruise occurs when the capillaries, small blood vessels beneath the skin, are ruptured. Totally consistent with a full force kick to the face. To the face, to the face. Lucky for Daniel, none of his injuries were too severe and he was able to recover in time for a rematch with his bully, Terry Silver. The stakes are high. If Daniel doesn't stop him here, Terry may become too powerful to be stopped and he would continue to spread his no mercy karate around the world. Since his arrival in season four, Terry has been gaining momentum, defeating many formidable opponents, including Johnny Lawrence. He only really fought Johnny, and at one point took down Robbie, but it was to teach him something. Yeah. 
and Daniel we've already seen. All the while amassing a following of faithful students and imposing goons, quick to lend a helping hand. Or a hurting hand. <laughs> You'd hope that Daniel would be well rested and mentally prepared for a challenge of this magnitude, but unfortunately the reality is the opposite. Nothing like a good long night of drinking and partying to prepare you to do battle. Daniel is exhausted, unprepared, and thrown into this situation earlier than he would have liked. And I wouldn't be surprised if his blood alcohol concentration is over 0.8%. Do we have a breathalyzer? Yes. Like, so, oh, we have a real one? Do, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Which in most people equates to approximately four drinks. Really had probably six or seven. At this level, your balance, vision, and reaction time are often impaired. So the verdict is uh, 0.11. <laughs> Wait, is that a lot or not? That being said, in the time it took for Daniel to hitchhike, he walked and then caught a ride with Stingray in Johnny's old car on his way to the dojo, he's likely sobered up some. Blood alcohol drops about 0.015% per hour. Not a whole lot. Is it? He's also stepped into the role of protective father, and the adrenaline coursing through his veins will increase alertness and energy, offsetting some of the alcohol in his system. That's technically why adrenaline feels like it sobers you up. It doesn't, but it counteracts some of the disorienting effects of the alcohol. With the right balance of adrenaline and dopamine, a chemical associated with pleasure released by our brain when we drink alcohol, we begin to understand the origin of the term liquid courage. Let's hope that Daniel looks more like this than this. Oh, oh you think you got moves? Check out my dancing. <laughs> But with everything that's at stake for Daniel, he seems to regain most of his composure for the battle, even if that seems a little far-fetched based on the night he's had so far. Meanwhile, Terry is fresh off a of fighting Chosen with deadly weapons, Psy versus a sword, only minutes before. <laughs> So he's not in the best of shape either, but with no major injuries to report other than some minor cuts and bruises. Chosen on the other hand, we last saw bleeding out in the pool outside, his back sliced wide open by a sneaky slash from Terry's sword. So listen, you wanna know how to win a fight? Just wait until the opponent is not looking. Look over there. Where? Confusion. Chosen suffers a fairly deep laceration spanning from the right shoulder blade down at an angle towards the middle of the back, possibly crossing the spine, though it is difficult to discern its exact location from the footage. We see him falling onto his back in the shallow water, unconscious. Due to the location and the depth of the laceration, it seems unlikely that Terry severed any major blood vessels, and Chosen is not at an immediate risk of bleeding out. The sword looks to have been deflected by the shoulder blade and the rib cage, missing vital organs. My guess is that the resultant pain put Chosen into a state of shock and he lost consciousness. My biggest concern as he lands with his head turned to the left, partially submerged in the water, is drowning. But the director must have considered that and the final shot shows his head upright with his airway unobstructed. As far as Terry's concerned, he's just left Chosen for dead and the adrenaline is definitely running high by the time he and Daniel square off. You got your ass kicked. Daddy boy, now you can either accept that or fight back. So as Cobra Kai fans already know, Terry Silver will be using Tang Soo Do, a martial art similar to karate that comes from Korea. This style incorporates hand strikes, kicks, and blocks alongside jiu-jitsu or aikido style wrist grabs to create powerful fighters who can strike strategically and with force. Practitioners of the style also have experience with weapons like the sword as Terry has already demonstrated. Unfortunately in Cobra Kai, Master Kim has morphed this style, initially intended for self-defense, into way of the fist 
which welcomes cheating and excessive force to win at any cost. Daniel, on the other hand, practices Miyagi-Do Karate, which he learned from Mr. Miyagi back in the first Karate Kid movie, helping him to win the 1984 All-Valley Tournament. Similar to actual Tang Su Do, Miyagi Do focuses on balance, self defense, and honor, which is how Daniel uses it in most cases. It is theorized to be inspired by Goju Ryu Karate, which combines hand striking attacks such as kicks and close hand punches with softer open hand circular techniques for attacking, blocking, and controlling the opponent. As we learned back in Season 3, Miyagi-Do has some deadly secrets. The fighters circle each other for a moment, exchanging pleasantries before the action begins. Silver feigns turning away to mock Daniel to the watching audience, only to attempt a surprise attack with some quick fist strikes and a high kick aimed at his head. This type of attack is typical of Cobra Kai members, but Daniel is ready and retaliates with a powerful backhand to the right side of Terry's face that sends him spinning towards the ground. A backhand strike leverages momentum, hurling the bones of the hand into the target like a stone at the end of a sock. While the hand isn't all that heavy, typically only about 0.575% of the total body weight, which equates to only 1.03 pounds in a 180 pound person, a fighter can still generate considerable force with this type of strike by twisting their body and swinging the arm wide. You know, like they do in the UFC. Very different from a straight punch with bones stacked and the full weight of the fighter behind it, but still dangerous depending on where it lands. Terry's head spins with enough force that a concussion is not at all inconceivable. Whenever the head moves sharply, the brain inside floating in cerebral spinal fluid is jostled against the inside of the skull. Not to mention any number of facial injuries that the victim could sustain such as a fractured cheekbone or damage to the orbital eye socket area. If the blow caught him lower, there's a risk of cracking teeth, busting open a lip, or even breaking the nose. Being the experienced fighter that he is, Terry is able to shake it off once again on the attack. Rule number one, a man can't stand, he can't fight. In true Miyagi-Do fashion, Daniel's defense is smooth and effective, deflecting two punches with relative ease. And for anyone who isn't a karate master, blocking a kick with both arms may result in some bruising the next day. Or at worst, the kick could fracture or break a bone in your arm, either the radius, ulna, or both which would also probably result in the end of the fight. Luckily, Daniel has been tempering his forearm strength since he was a teenager, training under Miyagi himself. How else would he have been able to break the blocks of ice in Karate Kid 2? You need forearms of steel to do that. Over time, a fighter can expose their forearms or shins to repeated strikes, gradually increasing in strength to harden and condition the bones. So what I like to do is I like to go home, turn on some loud music, and beat the crap out of my shins until it breaks in my hand. Have you ever seen a fighter training by kicking or punching a tree or a bamboo stick? I'll sit there and I'll, condi I'll ding my shins. The effect of this striking is twofold. Repeated striking will deaden the nerves in the area of impact, allowing the fighter to withstand higher pressure with less pain. Second, each impact causes tiny fractures in the bone, similar to micro tears that occur when lifting weight, that the body repairs stronger than before. Wolf's Law, for the win. Look it up. Although Terry kicks with considerable force and his shin or tibia is much thicker than Daniel's forearm, he is met with the conditioned arms of a pro. Daniel expertly follows up with a well-placed blow to the midsection that allows him to take control of Terry's wrist. He can't fight. A blow to the upper portion of your abdomen will strike the liver, beneath the diaphragm and to the right of your stomach. 
The punch shocks the liver, the largest gland organ, and a center of blood circulation, and can be extremely oh. painful, sending the victim to the floor. Oh. It is unclear if Daniel's blow crosses far enough across Terry's body to reach the liver on the right side, but the reaction is similar. As always, Ken Hub has us covered. This is the liver, and this is what happens when someone punches you in the liver. And even if Daniel missed the liver, the abdomen is relatively soft, especially when abdominal muscles aren't flexed and full of important organs which could be injured with enough force, leaving the victim open for a follow-up. Daniel takes advantage and expertly applies a standing arm lock. Holding Terry's outstretched arm by the wrist and pressing on his shoulder joint, Daniel forces his shoulder into abduction and rotation at the same time, a common mechanism of injury for anterior shoulder dislocations. The guy grabs you, you grab the wrist, you step over, and you submit him. All right, that's how we train. I was impressed by this video from Self Defense Tutorials, who demonstrates how this move can be used to maximum effect. He doesn't have his hand on the opponent's shoulder like Daniel, but the move is basically the same. Alternatively, though we never actually see Terry's hand, Daniel may be applying a reverse wrist lock, which forces the wrist joint into hyperextension in order to control opponents. More like this demonstration from Coda Combatives. I'm gonna step out and into uh, the wrist lock. Pretty much, let's, let's move this way so you can see your hand. One wrong move and snap, broken wrist, which could severely handicap whichever fighter sustains it. And so, Terry is careful not to move too quickly and further jeopardize his shoulder or wrist joint before he attempts one of his cheap shot moves, the silver bullet. The silver bullet is a move invented by Terry to strike the opponent directly in his solar plexus to debilitating effect, where the attacker extends their pointer and middle fingers further than the rest of the fist to achieve higher striking accuracy. The solar plexus is that soft spot between the bottom of your sternum and the top of your abdomen. This complex system of radiating nerves and ganglia is an integral part of the involuntary nervous system that regulates the various organs within the abdominal cavity and sends and receives signals from the brain. It sits directly in front of the aorta, the largest blood vessel in your body, and the diaphragm. You know, the structure that helps you to breathe. Are we beginning to see why a strike here can be so devastating? I call it the silver bullet. That's good. You like that, huh? Surely the opponent will not. With enough force, a blow to the solar plexus will cause the diaphragm to <laughs> spasm and they won't be able to breathe. But I just can't breathe. Not to mention the pain. Worse yet, you could actually do nerve damage to someone and cause their body to malfunction in a very serious way. Heart attack or even issues with the brain. It's a bit of a grab bag and obviously Terry Silver enjoys the chaotic effect of such a strike. Today, however, his attack is foiled by Miyagi-Do Miracle. Now, you know I can't let this one slide. Could someone really do this? Has Daniel done it before? Had he seen it somewhere? Does it even make logical sense? Like honestly, my mind is a little bit blown here. So if I'm to believe this, Daniel pincers Terry's arm between his knee and his elbow, preventing Terry's hit from connecting all while standing on one leg. The successful execution of such a precise defensive maneuver would require incredible proprioception and hip flexor core and latissimus muscle strength, as Daniel must exert pressure from above and below the incoming fist to stop the momentum completely. Like, really? We must also consider the size and shape of the anatomical structures involved. The wrist is less than two inches across and the olecranon bone, which forms the point of the elbow, isn't much larger in diameter than a 25 cent coin. Both of these structures are rounded and the bones insulated by flexible tissue and in this case, clothing. Can you imagine trying to catch an incoming PVC pipe sliding across the table with just your elbow? Chances are you would misplace the elbow and your elbow would slide off, for a painful surprise. That said, Daniel had a feeling that Terry would go for something dirty, like the silver bullet. And he knew that if Terry landed that shot, 
it might very well be over for him and his dojo. So he really had no choice but to do the impossible. He then strikes back with a straight punch to the right side of Terry's face that by the angle of attack looks to land near the right orbital bone or zygomaxillary complex. A bare knuckle strike in this location could easily cause a fracture. If severe enough, this could land Terry in the hospital and by the time he leaves there will likely be surgical plates and screws in his face. But the force of Daniel's punch would have been restricted to some degree because he is standing on one leg and cannot recruit the twisting force of the core as he would with both feet on the ground. But Terry isn't out of gas yet and he comes at Daniel again. But to no avail. Ironically, Terry's breathing becomes more labored as Daniel remembers the lessons he learned from him back in Karate Kid. Three. Terry imparts the second of three tenets that compose the Quicksilver Method. Rule number two of the Quicksilver Method. A man can't breathe. He can't fight. And Daniel makes his move, combining the Screaming Eagle with Terry's Silver Bullet for a double-fisted punch to the midsection that knocks the wind out of Silver and sends him flying backwards. Show them the Screaming Eagle. Ready? Yeah! Ready? 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 The typical Screaming Eagle features hand flexed away from the midline for more of an open palm strike. Daniel's closed fist variation is far more threatening. Maybe Daniel was listening in on today's lecture and chose to target Terry's solar plexus with the upper fist and his stomach or intestines with the lower one. Can't fight. As Terry holds his midsection, keeling over in pain, it almost looks like he's about to throw up. Which makes sense, since a punch to the abdomen can induce hyperperistalsis, a wave of contraction of the tubular organs in the gastrointestinal tract, and could cause the victim to regurgitate their dinner. Or in other words, <laughs> But somehow, Terry keeps it down and, grasping for an unfair advantage in a fight, grabs the trophy from the last All-Valley Tournament. You know, the one that he won by cheating? Played it just right. No one suspects a thing. Money would be in your account tomorrow. Getting hit with a hefty trophy in the head or anywhere else is bound to cause significant damage. A quality made trophy is not light. Hey! 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 It would be like beating somebody with a club or another blunt object, except that this object has sharp edges. But as Daniel rises into the posture of the crane kick and the triumphant music plays, we won't have to worry about any trophy-induced trauma. Daniel unleashes the final blow on Terry as he turns around to face him, sending him sprawling backwards and into the glass Cobra Kai centerpiece, smashing it to pieces as Terry falls into the wreckage. Luckily for Terry, the mirror is tempered glass which breaks into small rounded shards to prevent injury. But that won't save him from the concussion that he is likely suffering, as he looks to be tottering on the edge of consciousness. Taking a closer look at the crane kick, we see Daniel's toes connect with Terry's forehead, snapping his head backwards dramatically. This has got whiplash written all over it, and Terry faces the possibility of straining muscles or ligaments in the cervical spine. Like, I, I think I did that to myself, actually. He won't be getting up anytime soon. Be sure to let me know your thoughts and what you'd like to see me react to next down in the comments. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. And if you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comments section. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, Not Your Everyday Ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.